Good evening and thanks for joining me this evening. Um, I'm going to tackle a topic that I think I um, uh, thankfully have um, now seven years of experience uh, here with CORE, helping our patients stay active um, when they deal with all types of foot and ankle injuries and arthritis, no matter which joint um, of the foot and ankle that it may reside. So uh, thank you for being here and um, I hope to uh, save plenty of time at the end for all your questions. Um, so first I want to just start with um, kind of a stepwise approach. So I uh, do have the uh, great pleasure on also training numerous um, foot and ankle fellows. And when I kind of um, am teaching, uh, my job is to, ask, to encourage them to take a sometimes uh, simple looking problem, understand that it may not be so simple, um, and then help them to know when uh, and how fast we can move patients along through their continuum of care, getting rehabbed, and ultimately back to a very healthy lifestyle. Um, so uh, just, uh, w so one of the things that I teach them is confirm stability. Um, we wanna maintain stability, and then we wanna rehab to maintain their optimal function. Just uh, with that, um, sometimes we have to go in and scope the joint. Sometimes we have to clean out cartilaginous um, issues. Uh, we also, um, anything that's loose, we'll take the, uh, we'll take the cartilaginous uh, loose pieces out of the joint, get their ankle back to nice and rectus, confirm their uh, stability. Uh, here we want to make sure that the ankle is a rectus hinge joint, that they have all of their high uh, ankle ligaments, what's called the syndesmosis intact. Uh, here is my hand uh, approximately on this x-ray, uh, stressing the deltoid ligament, making sure that both sides of their hinge are intact. And after we do that, then we want to get that patient moving as quickly as possible. So that seems like, for, and that's only one break in those original x-rays that I showed you. So a lot of what I try to teach my fellows and I try to teach my patients on a daily basis is trying to, to look at an injury understand the ways in which we can kind of overcome all the additional aspects of the primary injury um, and really help a, anybody move on with their life as fast as possible. Sometimes it's overwhelming though. So here's my, uh, my two precious uh, boys um, who get inundated by their grandparents with 18 uh, potato heads that they had purchased at a thrift store for like less than the cost of one potato head. Um, but when I saw talking with my children on how to go about making uh, and picking something out, you have to tell them, okay, pick one set of eyes, one nose, one mouth, one set of feet, and you know, a fun uh, doodad to put on the <laughs> potato head to make them express themselves. It's kind of the same thing with um, surviving uh, a foot and ankle injury or arthritis is we want to do a few simple things to make sure that you can maintain your, um, your independence, uh, that you can um, adequately heal, and that you can get on to life without having uh, any uh, issues with uh, your gait, ultimately. So anytime you sustain an injury to the foot and ankle, we want to keep the parts moving that we can keep moving. You necessarily, um, uh, may not be able to move one, two, three, sometimes, you know, depending upon what type of uh, accident you sustain, um, such as a motor vehicle accident, you may not be able to move up to a third of your foot, uh, secondary to pain, swelling uh, and intraarticular pathology. It doesn't matter, but the parts that aren't affected, we want to make sure that we keep those parts moving. So um, if you do sustain an injury, make sure if you are full weight bearing, uh, meaning if you're able to bear weight, you wanna keep the legs functioning rather uh, evenly, even though your foot and ankle may be out of commission. So what that means is make sure your hips um, are maintained at an equal height, make sure your knees are at an equal height, um, and if you have to go into a boot or some sort of um, device that causes you to have to tilt your pelvis, uh, have your hips and knees not at the same height, that you affix something to the bottom of your opposite foot to help even you out. Um, that's one of the, th the biggest mistakes that I think I see 
um, patients that tried to uh, treat an injury on their own for a while. A lot of times now people will purchase a uh, cam walker, whether it be a short uh, or a tall one off of Amazon, uh, and they walk around in this cam walker for you know sometimes two, three months, but they haven't maintained their legs at equal lengths. So by the time they get to my office, they now have hip, knee, back pain, secondary to their unequal limb lengths. Um, so if you um, are trying to doctor a um, injury at home by yourself, um, make sure that you um, purchase something to help uh, equal out your legs or find your thickest shoe in the closet. So for most people, that's a sh uh, hiking boot, whether it be a short or a tall hiking boot. They can put that on the bottom of their contralateral leg to help even themselves out. So. Um, when you talk about trying to um, immobilize after a foot and ankle injury, um, in general, uh, as long as there's not a tendon involved in your injury, um, we need to immobilize to one joint proximal. I do make that caveat about tendons um, because if you, for instance, if you hurt your Achilles tendon, your Achilles tendon goes all the way to your femur. So we do sometimes have to immobilize more proximal, so it's really important um, that if any tendon is involved, that uh, you definitely seek medical care because this um, advice doesn't necessarily, um, uh, it's not quite as clear cookie cut de depending upon where all the insertion points of the tendon. However, for intraarticular pathology and just arthritis, so um, issues uh, you know, such as uh, bone on bone arthritis, if you have any cysts, if you've ever been told you had bone spurs, um, if you have a bunch of uh, pain and swelling in the joint, then these are um, some easy uh, things that you can uh, uh, attempt on your own. Uh, or if it's taking you time to get a referral to come in to see a physician, these are some of the first steps that you can uh, take on your own. So, so number one is if your pathology is mostly, if, if my hand is your, is your foot uh, and my fingers are your toes, if the pathology is to your toes or to right where your toes meets your um, foot, then you can in general go into a forefoot or a, uh, that's considered a forefoot pathology and you can go into a post-operative shoe or a hiking boot. Once you have problems more in the, the arch of your foot or the bridge, in general, um, again, uh, you, these are mostly injuries that need to be in a short cam boot or a fracture boot. If it's more the hind foot or ankle, then we talk about having, needing somebody to go into a tall cam boot or a short leg cast. Um, and then lastly, if you have something, if you've if it's more a young person or a, a really bad, um, like a Dak Prescott kind of uh, injury, if any of you are NFL fans out there, those are patients that are going to hit, need to, their injury is pretty high and they're going to actually need a long leg cast. Um, so anytime you have um, any problem that is in a joint, we try to start out with the, sh the least amount of mobilization so that we can keep the rest of the leg moving. Um, once we, no matter which of these you go into, as long as it's not a cast, I would always recommend that you utilize compression socks. Compression socks here are fantastic because they will help control your pain, they will help control the swelling, and they help prevent blood clots. Um, so just for um, a point of discussion, the picture here um, where uh, there's a post-op shoe uh, on this patient on the right foot on the left and on the left foot on the right. Um, this, I always tell patients, these devices are also universal ugly, right? They go on both feet. Nobody likes them. I'm sorry. <laughs> I did not design them. Um, but they are universal ugly. Uh, and so if it, it, no matter which device it is, keep it. Because um, a lot of insurance plans also don't, will not dispense an additional device to you. Um, unless it's been five years since that device was, caught, was um, first dispensed. So uh, insurance plans are constantly changing. They're constantly trying to get out of paying for something. So I always tell patients after we get you healed, you're going to put this in the bottom of your closet or the top of your closet, bury it in the backyard. I don't care where, but be able to always um, get it back out so that if you ever hurt yourself again, number one, 
you can put yourself in it before you come see me. Um, and uh, that it, you can always use it on the opposite foot. You can give it to a friend, a neighbor, anybody else if they have any injuries. Um, once we get um, a injury or a, uh, the arthritic part to not be hurting so much, it's also important to kind of work back ways on this system so that um, we get the joints moving uh, in a manner that you're less likely to irritate um, the initial spot first. So for instance, if you end up hurting um, your, if you have a, a simple ankle fracture that's below the level of the joint, that's something that we can typically put into a tall uh, cam boot. That type of injury, once we get it healed, I will work backwards with patients to then have them after I clear them from being in the boot, I'll put them into an ankle brace. After the ankle brace, I'll have the therapist work them down to an ankle sleeve. And so we slowly put more and more weight back into the joint after you've had a problem that involves a joint. That helps you continuously keep moving forward. It also gives you the ability to listen to your body, to, to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And um, it also um, gives you the confidence as you continue to move forward that you know that you can keep adding a little bit more without setting yourself back. So um, just like that last um, slide that I showed with the options for injury and how to immobilize after an injury, what is more common I think and where patients often have a lot of um, questions, is what to do with arthritis? How do I keep living um, without fe feeling debilitated? Uh, and that's a, a really um, big part of my job that I very much enjoy, also for personal reasons. I love being active. I love uh, making sure that I can go for a run, ride bikes, go skiing, go hiking, uh, water ski, uh, keep up with my kids. All these sorts of things are very um, important to me and I try to, to really understand each person's uh, personal journey um, so that we make sure that we can get you into a device that allows you to do what you love on an ongoing basis. Um, so if it's painful arthritis, do the same, uh, same thing. If it's a forefoot problem, immobilize the forefoot. Um, what it does when you immobilize the f any body part in in the site of arthritis is it prevents the motion. So you get arthritis uh, pain once you lose the cartilage. Um, once that protective cartilage is gone in your joint and you start having bone on bone rubbing, that's when arthritis gets painful. So the way to keep moving is to take away that joint. So it's basically you're bracing specifically for the joint that's involved. So if it's, uh, for instance, a problem with your big toe, um, this uh, extension that is pictured here under, uh, with the blue background, that's called a Morton's extension. So a Morton's extension is essentially a popsicle stick underneath your big toe that allows you to keep walking without having the grinding pain in your big toe. Um, a lot of people, you know, arthritis in your big toe doesn't get the press like hips and knees because we don't, uh, we have implants, but they're not as, as widely marketed. Um, however, big toe arthritis is the second most common place in the entire body to get arthritis. So this is a, a an area that's very, very prevalent. So if you, you know, have a, fr a friend, family member, neighbor, or yourself that has really bad arthritis um, pain in your big toe, I would definitely recommend um, these Morton's extensions here. Um, another thing is, is if you feel like you have kind of arthritis pain underneath your little um, toes, uh, so your second, third, fourth, or fifth, um, those are um, can also be treated very nicely with what's called an insert with a metatarsal pad. Um, that's a great first step. And unfortunately, if you have global pathology, meaning if it's in your first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, um, then you'll be better suited with something called a metatarsal bar. And a metatarsal bar basically levitates the ball of the foot. So as you walk from heel to your toes, we basically skip those in joints entirely. Um, so those are some of the things, um, some of those are available over the counter, some of them are custom molded. So if you can't find them um, over, the, 
over the counter, uh, they're probably one of those custom molded devices that you'll need to come in for. But um, definitely what one thing during the pandemic, a lot of more of these things are readily available um, uh, online. So uh, certainly try what you can online first, but if you're having difficulty, come in and see somebody. Um, uh, UCBLs um, uh, are this brace. These are great if somebody has a really, really bad flat foot that's now starting to affect their ankle. So um, not only can a bad flat foot deformity um, cause you to get a lot of uh, arthritis in your hind foot, but over time, as the foot starts to fall more into a valgus position, you'll actually start taking your ankle out of socket. Um, and so it, as long as your ankle is not out of socket, this is a great way to control really bad um, arthritis secondary to a flat foot. If your ankle is involved, we have to get a little bit more cumbersome bracing uh, or it's really time to start talking surgery if you're having uh, pain and it's an affecting your uh, daily life. Maintaining um, activity with ankle uh, arthritis or following a cartilaginous uh, or a cartilage injury to your ankle um, uh, can, can be cumbersome. And, and as we go higher up the leg, the braces, um, a lot of times people feel, uh, I think, more hindered by the braces, um, not just because you're taking away major function, meaning uh, moving your ankle up and down to go up and down stairs. You're also um, a lot of times, unfortunately, locking up their ability to accommodate for uneven surfaces. Uh, and those things can make people um, extremely hesitant to um, do certain activities. So if you feel like you're hesitating um, and not really um, sure of yourself, if you feel like you're becoming a fall risk, those are all definitely times that you need to seek medical attention for your ankle arthritis, because um, you don't want to get into a vicious cycle where you start falling and hurting other things because you're trying to protect your ankle. Um, if your ankle um, is very stable, but just feels like a little bit puffy and swollen, this first brace in the top left, uh, a neoprene sleeve or sock can be very helpful. If your pain is only on really one side of the joint, um, and you feel like if you could just dial your foot into a little bit better position, utilizing the ASO, which is on the bottom left here, um, is a great first brace to try. However, if you're more, um, uh, if you like high impact activities, jumping activities, so those are um, particularly volleyball players, uh, basketball players, uh, those uh, sorts of activities where you're coming off the ground and you have to make sure you have stability of both your ankle going up and down and the joint underneath of that called the subtalar joint, those patients are going to be better served in um, a brace. Uh, and the one that I usually recommend is called an A60 just because it's readily available uh, and it's thin enough that you can still fit it uh, in most uh, sports performance shoes. So what, what do I kind of suggest, whether it be injury or arthritis, what kind of things can you keep doing and which one should you stop doing is a question that I very frequently um, get from my patients. So why, the first, the first thing is, is also for me to encourage you to maintaining a healthy lifestyle, um, a healthy lifestyle and activity will not only prevent muscular atrophy, It'll allow you um, to uh, maintain overall strength of the body part that's affected, AKA your foot and ankle, but it will also help you maintain your overall health. Um, it prevents weight gain, uh, which ultimately prevents metabolic complications. Sometimes we see patients after really horrific uh, injuries that um, have to take you know, months of sedentary, if it's a polytrauma, meaning like a car accident, um, and those patients can really, uh, if they, especially if they've been on some steroids, they can get some metabolic complications. So uh, even in that type of a, a patient, um, it's important that we educate you on what you can do. So things that you can do, as long as you haven't injured your spine along with your foot and ankle pathology, you can always engage your core, do ab workouts, um, as long as you haven't injured your upper extremity, keep doing upper extremity workouts free weights, TheraBands, uh, pull-ups, chin-ups, all of these things are great. So just like this picture here on the left, sometimes you're still gonna have to rest, ice, and elevate. 
but you can still, even when you're bedridden, you can still work out. There are still um, ways to um, maintain uh, your sanity while you're kind of having to, to be a couch potato at times, okay? This will also help uh, encourage and maintain your bone health. So preventing osteopenia, osteoporosis, um, uh, particularly in our older patients is really important as you recover because you don't want to end up uh, getting weak bones that then you get into a vicious cycle of stress fractures and through and through fractures, insufficiency fractures, etc. So um, those are the things that you should be doing. So what are the things that you should stop? Uh, number one is any high impact activity. Anytime you're coming off the ground, anytime both feet come off the ground and you come back to the ground, that is eight times your body weight. However much you weigh, eight times your body, eight times your body weight is not a good idea on an, in an injured body part. So uh, things like stunting uh, for gymnasts. Uh, I'm okay if my gymnasts go and keep learning their routines. They keep up their, their health, but I don't want them to do the stunting portions. Um, for instance, uh, cheerleaders. Those are patients you don't want them being flipped and doing aerials and being caught, um, but they're okay to go and learn the routine. Uh, running, however, um, again, running is always two feet off the ground. That's one that you should really um, dial back unless you have an anti-gravity treadmill uh, or aquatics um, that are available to you. If you're a high, um, you know, a college athlete or a professional athlete, I can get patients on those sorts of running activities, but the average um, patient is not going to have uh, the means to um, anti-gravity treadmills. Um, uh, or just the access to it. So you may have the means, but it's hard to get those. Um, the other thing that you need to stop doing uh, is the, the contact sports. Again, I'm okay if my contact athletes continue to do uh, the training for their contact sport, um, as long as it doesn't involve the foot and ankle, but you shouldn't be actually doing the contact. Being in a, um, a large cam walker, a cast, anything that's not inducive um, to any sort of contact. So those are the things that you need to stop. Um, additionally, especially in the foot, your foot is the foundation of your body. Uh, if you have a particular part of your foot um, that uh, bears a lot of weight, uh, such as a dancer, you're gonna have to stop the positional overloading until that part no longer hurts or else you're going to create a vicious cycle of an inflammatory process or cartilage injury uh, to the affected body part anytime you keep overloading it. Um, the other thing, kind of to the point of the picture here on the right, is um, you should really, if, it, if your issue is um, your forefoot, don't keep wearing high-heeled shoes. For every one inch of a high heel that you go up, you put 25% more pressure in the ball of your foot. So if you want to wear a kitten heel, fine, do it. If you want to wear a wedge shoe, if you've hurt the ball of your foot, um, that's not too bad because there's not that big a difference between the, the wedge and the heel, uh, I'm sorry, the wedge height and the forefoot height. Um, but anything over an inch, I wouldn't recommend um, because you are really going to stress out the joints faster than you um, uh, should and you're preventing any healing. So some of the benefits of moving here, um, we know that uh, the brain effects of exercise are huge. It improves uh, energy. Uh, it helps you uh, maintain a great attention span. It helps uh, foster better um, skills, both decision-making as well as social skills. Um, it, it helps repair if you have any um, neurologic, any vascular issues. Um, medicine and movement help increase all the, the, the repair uh, on every body system. So movement here is huge. Um, if stretching um, is also very important um, with an injury, and one of the things that I recommend routinely to uh, patients, pr pretty much at nauseum, especially right now with the pandemic, because a lot of us have been sitting more at home, uh, not walking around the office as much. Um, our lives have kind of become shrunken as far as the number of steps that we're taking per day, is make sure that you continue to stretch. Um, do downward dogs, uh, just as this skeleton here uh, is nicely demonstrating. Uh, engage all that posterior muscle group from 
the back of the foot um, all the way up to your hips. Um, because a lot of us, as we're sitting, we don't engage any of those muscle groups on a, on a routine basis um, uh, when you're doing any computer work. Um, as far as maintaining muscle mass, um, if you have never done any of these exercise programs before, doing exercises um, either standing or sitting with low repetitive weights are a lot better than doing um, high, uh, high weights. Um, so simply if you have like a three or a five pound dumbbell, that's a lot better idea rather than going and getting 25 uh, pound dumbbells um, at your at a local sporting goods store, and then try to to knock out you know lucky sevens or um, uh, any of those upper extremity things. Um, so if you don't know what lucky sevens are, they're really fun. They're really good on the biceps. Um, but look it up. Um, one of the other things can that can be super um, helpful, um, just as my uh, my Phoenician kids here, whenever they see snow. They want to play. They want to play in it here barehanded. Uh, what they do then is end up, you know, coming back crying and saying, "My fingers are tingling. It hurts." They can't express what's going on, right? They don't know if it's completely numb. They don't know if it, they've given themselves frostbite. Um, but no matter where you have um, pain uh, in your foot, ankle, or other body parts, one of the great, uh, ways to initially control inflammation and pain is using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, non-steroidals are, um, uh, unless you have any gastric upset, uh, history of GI bleeding ulcers, uh, or chronic kidney disease, um, they're very, uh, low risk for, especially when you're just getting an over-the-counter, um, dosage of them. If you have any of those things that I just mentioned, um, the other thing that is now topical uh, and very easy to get is Voltaren gel. Um, the trade name for that is Diclofenac 1%. It's now available over the counter and you can utilize that on any body part up to four times a day. So that's a great uh, first uh, line of treatment. If you have any associated tingling and numbness, or that's called neuritis, um, then lidoderm patches are also a great option. They're available um, uh, over the counter at 4% or via prescription strength at 5%. So um, a lot of insurance plans also don't cover the 5% anymore. So I always tell patients, um, here's your script. I sent it over. If you've hit your deductible, go get 5%. However, if it's not covered, just go down the aisle <laughs> in the drugstore uh, and you can get it. And this is only 20% left less uh, effective, um, but it can save you a heck of a lot of money. So uh, that's a great cost saving strategy. Uh, when, however, do you need to seek medical treatment for um, your ankle arthritis, your forefoot injury? Um, if your pain doesn't improve with pills, right, um, uh, rest, ice, compression, and elevation, that's what price is, then you really need to seek medical attention. Um, uh, it also, if you cannot bear weight on your foot, um, this is also a time to seek medical attention. Um, the reason why is that you also need to make sure that you rule out cartilage injury, uh, full thickness tears, um, continued instability, uh, and also tendon tears. Um, most of the tendons uh, that are torn in uh, foot and ankle pathology actually tear like women's pantyhose. They tear longitudinally and then your um, tendons will kind of open up like a book. They don't tear like the Achilles. The Achilles gets all the press um, because people stop dead in their tracks, but that's not how the majority of foot and ankle tendons uh, tear. Uh, so there's not usually a bunch of retraction. You don't have usually big gaps that you can fill, feel. So if you continue to struggle uh, and uh, anti-inflammatories, rest, ice, compression, and elevation aren't helping you, uh, then again, seek medical attention. We really um, reserve steroids in a non-diabetic uh, po patient population for only um, recalcitrant pathologies uh, and ones that we know that they don't already have cartilage injury. If you have cartilage injury, um, then we really need to treat the source of the pain and not just inject you with a treatment that's gonna make your blood sugars spike uh, and not treat the source of the pain. Always control what you can. Um, the um, getting move, movement uh, here will also help you prevent osteoporosis. 
Um, so like I had said that one of the main reasons why we want to keep you moving is to improve your bone mass. Um, also be cognizant of the things that are, can also be detrimental to uh, arthritis um, healing and injury um, healing. So those um, risk factors that are in your control, if you use any tobacco products, stopping those improves your blood flow. Um, about 30% of your blood flow uh, for an hour after every cigarette will um, be diminished. So that's a huge way that you can improve immediately the blood flow to your foot and ankle. Um, low body weight. Um, and excessive body weight are actually both um, risk factors for osteoporosis. So you want to make sure that you maintain a healthy um, body weight. Um, lifelong low calcium intake, vitamin D deficiencies, and estrogen deficiencies are also um, different types of deficiencies that can be corrected um, for osteoporosis uh, and impaired eyesight. If you're start another one that's not on this list that you can kind of um, that we do see in the office if you um, feel like you have a lot of issues with um, balance. Uh, another thing that can make people not walk as much is actually if you have an inner ear problem. So if you, you know, have recurrent ear infections, um, sometimes people then don't end up doing as much walking um, because of an inner ear problem that then leads them to be more sedentary and that's a um, osteoporosis risk factor as well. Um, so any of those issues, if you're uh, unfortunately um, uh, have any of them, make sure um, that you seek medical attention so that you don't kind of get stuck in this continuum of um, uh, fall risks. So bone mass, uh, normal bone mass here on the left um, uh, versus osteoporotic bone here on the right. So osteoporosis is basically um, when you lose uh, a lot of the integrity of your bones and you're, you can sustain both insufficiency fractures and osteoporotic fractures. Um, so we, we test this via a scan called a DEXA scan um, and it is matched to people that are both your sex and your age. So this is a test that um, compares you against your peers basically. Um, so we um, are concerned um, uh, and I definitely send people for this test if they have a loss of height, if they have bone fractures without really any big injury, meaning you didn't trip on something, it was just from everyday walking, that you sustained your fractures, that you, um, some medications um, can also, that known side effect is bone uh, mass loss, and if you have a drop in your hormone levels. Um, it, when you do obtain a DEXA scan, it is also really important that you always get the DEXA scan done on the same scanner. Because it's such a matched study, if you have a scanner that's just a little bit not calibrated like the one across town, you can um, have an abnormal read um, and that can throw you into one category pretty quickly. So it is important that if you do, or if you're close to the place that you had your last DEXA scan, always go to the same DEXA scanner. Um, bone health treatments, and we have a great um, uh, bone health program here at CORE. I can't give uh, Dr. Crone enough um, uh, kudos for helping my patients over the years. Uh, he's great at identifying what medications you would be eligible for. Um, but if you're not to the point that, you, and hopefully you're not, uh, having really bad osteoporosis, some of the things that you can do if you're in osteopenia or if you just want to maintain your bone health is maintain a balanced diet, um, stop using the tobacco products, again, weight-bearing exercises, strengthening uh, and balance, and then make sure you have ad adequate calcium and vitamin D. Uh, recommended calcium uh, intake, uh, uh, these are all listed in milligrams and these are the dosing per day are here by age. Uh, uh, basically, for most of our listeners, I, I, I probably most of our audience is either 19 to 50. So for, for you all, you would need about 1,000 uh, milligrams every day. If you're over 50, that increases to 1,200. Um, the, the way, though, that in which your body best absorbs calcium is only in 500 to 600 uh, milligram increments. So uh, do get a, a dosed uh, make that dose additive up to either 1,000 or 1,200 per day, but take it only in the form of 500 uh, or 600, but take it twice a day. Vitamin D uh, deficiencies are probably one of the most um, 
uh, now gaining a lot, a lot of traction uh, in cardiovascular health, in mental health. Um, uh, but it's been known, obviously, for bone health for a while because to build bones, we have to have adequate calcium and vitamin D to basically make your bone go from a, a soft state to a hard state. So that conversion from soft calcium to hard calcium um, requires both calcium and vitamin D. Um, optimum serum, serum levels are um, 30 to 50. Um, and again, it's a, a essential to have vitamin D to also to be able to absorb the calcium. Um, and a multivitamin, or most multivitamins available over the counter are between uh, 400 and 800 IUs per day. Um, and uh, if you obtain uh, isolated uh, vitamin D capsules, such as like the kind that they sell at Costco, those are usually 1,000 to 2,000 IUs per day. Um, if we do have somebody with a very bad deficiency uh, and pathology that comes into the office, I often get serum cal uh, vitamin D levels uh, and I'll put them on a very high dose to make sure that they heal um, and during uh, their acute phase and that's up to 50,000 once weekly just so they don't have to be taking, you know, if I, if I tell them to supplement, that's 25 pills over the course of a week versus I can give them one tablet and patients are very thankful that they don't have to swallow 25 things in a week. Um, you can also get vitamin D by just going outside. Uh, 15 minutes per day, um, three times a week is what's recommended. So this is not becoming a sun worshiper. This is becoming a smart sun consumer, um, especially here in Phoenix. There's a big difference, right? Um, the best time to increase your vitamin D levels um, just because UVs are highest between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Um, the best place that you expose um, is your upper extremities and your face. And if you are going out to increase your in the sun to increase your vitamin D levels, make sure that you don't utilize um, an SPF of eight or greater as it blocks UV rays. Um, your ability to produce vitamin D via the sun also depends on how much melatonin you have. So that's basically, basically based upon your um, skin tone. So lighter skin produces more because more of those UV light will penetrate your skin. Darker complected African Americans, um, Native Americans, Asians uh, tend to, you will not produce as, as much because you have more melatonin and the melatonin will basically block the UVs and uh, from being absorbed. Um, our also, unfortunately, our production, uh, our body's ability to produce this does decrease with age. So it's also important that if you are um, older, that you take more and don't just assume that you're getting it through your sun exposure. You really should be more supplementing through oral means. You can also get it through your um, diet and I uh, encourage you to, to read about these. Some of these I don't know, I've never consumed, like cod liver. Um, however, wild salmon, uh, eggs, um, uh, certain mushrooms, uh, you know, margarine, milk, those sorts of things um, are a great um, source of vitamin D. You can also make wise choices if you, um, at the grocery store for instance, calcium and vitamin D are, a lot of, are in a lot of fortified orange juice products. So if you're already buying orange juice, it costs no additional money to purchase the orange juice that's fortified versus the orange juice you're already, produce, you're already purchasing. So go ahead and purchase the uh, fortified one. Um, if you have been diagnosed uh, as osteoporotic or you've sustained osteoporotic fractures, um, definitely, however, seek bone health consult because you um, may need uh, supplementation in forms of medications. And these are just the classes of medications that can uh, be utilized to treat your uh, bone pathology. So post-injury uh, and with uh, ankle uh, arthritis, foot arthritis, we will help you find your path. That's what we're here for. Um, if you uh, end up needing a, a scope, so a more of that minimally invasive um, uh, procedure, uh, we can certainly help you with that. If you need an open reconstruction, uh, if you need a total ankle replacement, uh, or if you even need a fusion, um, I'm here to help you uh, if um, your simple immobilization does not help. So uh, here's uh, me with one of my current fellows um, doing more of a, a, this is an invasive surgery here on the left. Uh, here's kind of some of the procedures that we um, 
utilize uh, on the, the right. Um, so this is a cartilaginous procedure where we're utilizing juvenile cartilage. So that helps um, you get uh, uh, a basically a fibrous cap on your cartilage injury that um, uh, is utilizing uh, cartilage that has a lot better healing potential than maybe what your age allows you to have. So what happens, however, uh, also part of my job is uh, encouraging people to, to know when to call it quits um, as far as uh, when conservative treatment fails. What do we do? So this is a um, very pleasant but unfortunate lady that was involved in a drive-by bilateral ankle shooting. Um, so she's my one and only patient that's ever had um, this. Normally, if you have a gunshot wound to one leg, it does not go through the next leg, thankfully. Um, however, this is kind of a good uh, case study of um, an ankle that I was able to continue to treat um, uh, via conservative means versus one after she was treated uh, by an outside traumatologist, one that we had to eventually um, uh, say no more. Um, so this uh, lady, uh, 35-year-old, again, uh, was involved in this gunshot uh, injury. It was w uh, sustained one year ago. Um, and she's a hairdresser that wants to be able to work on her feet again, uh, but now has a bullet that went through the, the bottom half of her tibia and as well as the top half of her talus. Um, so part of my discussion uh, uh, with this uh, very unfortunate um, a lady that was basically uh, in the crossfire um, was uh, making sure that she understood what we're up against here. Um, any type of job where you're on your feet that many hours a day um, is very hard, whether it's a total ankle or whether it's an ankle fusion. Um, you wear your joints out a lot by standing in the same position uh, for 10, sometimes 12 hours a day. Um, so uh, again, this is what after a year, the front of her bone wasn't looking healthy. So she ended up undergoing, uh, we did a kind of a minimally invasive uh, ankle fusion on her uh, three, uh, via a three uh, screw home run technique. Um, and she uh, ironically did so great, I didn't see her back uh, for more than three years. So this is my favorite type of patient to see, is one that comes back three years later for a totally unrelated opposite foot problem. So she had sustained a stress fracture on her opposite foot. Um, but she um, thankfully heeded some of the advice of you having sometimes uh, the best thing to do to kind of get over some injuries is also kind of change the tune in the way that we deal with the injuries. Um, so thankfully um, here locally we have great assistance programs if you're involved uh, in random acts of violence. She was able to get some assistance, was retrained uh, for a different type of job, um, was uh, gainfully employed, got a new house. Uh, and she had changed professions and she was very happy with that advice. So no matter where you're at um, in your foot and ankle journey, um, I'm here to help and hopefully you have uh, got some great advice. It's not always clear. Sometimes uh, our path is clear. Um, this is uh, one of my uh, favorite hikes that I took this summer, kind of escaping the <laughs> Um, practice life. And so this said that this was the front, you could go up the front or the back of Han. Uh, and um, no matter what, sometimes it's a glorious view when you get to the other side. There's lots of different ways you can go. Uh, but our job is to help you enjoy the view uh, through the process and also uh, once you're to the other side. So thank you for joining me and I'll now open it up to questions. Yeah, so uh, Morton's neuromas are uh, basically when you pinch a nerve between the ball of your foot. Um, as I kind of alluded to earlier with those forefoot orthotics, the best thing to try first is an insert with a metatarsal pad. Uh, if that fails, um, either alcohol sclerosing injections or cortisone inject injections are both options. Uh, those um, You do have to have obviously a provider to um, get those medications. So if it doesn't feel better, I'd probably give it a month uh, with that insert. If it doesn't feel better after a month, I would seek medical attention. So um, arthritis uh, is usually pain with range of motion of the joint is what people will first uh, notice. Um, also, if you have any puffiness of the joint uh, and redness.
So definitely get an orthotic um, if it's kind of more mid-tarsal. Um, and also uh, steroid injections are uh, options for that. And anti-inflammatory, uh, so non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. That really depends on what type of implant and if the implant is well seated. So after surgery from a total ankle replacement, as long as it's a uh, only an ankle replacement that you didn't need any other fusion with it, we get those patients walking three weeks after the procedure once their incision heals. Um, because your fat over the ankle is a lot thinner than over hips and knees, we do have to keep you off of it until the incision heals. It's not walking same day um, like a hip or a knee. But as soon as we know that the incision heals, we get you moving. Um, so uh, again, if you had a total ankle replacement and you feel like you cannot walk, definitely seek medical attention because you should be able to walk on it. So chronic plantar fasciitis, um, acute plantar fasciitis, meaning it just started, or heel pain, is one of the things uh, in the foot and ankle realm that we see the most of. Um, so treatments for that are, um, uh, you know, utilize inserts, um, anti-inflammatory steroids, stretching, um, making sure that you um, also respect that the Achilles tendon has uh, conjoined fibers that insert on the back of your heel. So a lot of people that end up getting chronic plantar fasciitis may have not been educated fully that they need to be stretching, doing those downward dogs, working out their Achilles tendon. So number one is I would definitely work out your Achilles. Um, number two is a lot of times uh, as a pathology goes from more acute to more of a chronic issue, you're basically not only fighting the um, uh, inflammatory tissue, you're now fighting scar tissue. So you basically need to have a plan of action uh, to the scar tissue. So things such as the Graston technique with physical therapy, dry needling to improve blood flow, um, platelet-rich plasma, uh, our 10X, uh, or what's called a microtonotomy. Those are all procedures that can improve your blood flow and help you counterbalance the fasciosis involved with chronic plantar fasciitis. Uh, lastly, some people do end up getting their nerve entrapped on the bottom of their foot in that scar tissue. So if it's more of a stabbing pain, you really need to rule out any nerve involvement because sometimes it's misdiagnosed. Um, so do seek medical attention in the chronic realm. Uh, that can mean a lot of things. Uh, if it's not with injury, the most uh, common uh, reason that people get pain in the ball of the foot is usually a stress fracture. Um, you can also develop um, avascular necrosis or um, basically dying of the metatarsal heads, that that can be acute and sudden. Um, so uh, if you have acute onset of pain uh, in the ball of the foot that's not relenting by uh, anti-inflammatories, rest, ice, uh, elevation, and compression, I would definitely seek medical attention. So those are, that's uh, to that, the question also about plantar fasciitis, that is heel pain. Uh, usually uh, for heel pain to go away, stay away, um, you need a multimodality approach. So it's not usually just one thing, and it's those things that I just mentioned uh, for cr acute plantar fasciitis. Um, usually if it's directly after activity, ice is better. Um, heat um, is better for muscular pain, however, so if you ha have more of like a cramping sensation, uh, you're going to do better with um, heat. If you feel like um, you have any hematoma or basically a big collection of a bruise after an injury, uh, usually a combination of heat and ice because it'll actually break up the blood. So it just depends on kind of uh, if you have any associated symptoms with it. So um, Achilles tendonitis kind of depends on where your tendonitis is, um, just because the Achilles uh, crosses three um, different joints. Um, and it, depending upon which part of your Achilles hurts um, is very different. So up higher, 
Um, it's where the muscle attaches to the tendon. That type of Achilles tendonitis needs to be immobilized. That's actually a gastrocnemia strain. Uh, if it's more in what's called the watershed region of your Achilles, that needs to be immobilized. It has a very high rate of rupture. If it's more, however, right where the Achilles inserts onto the back of the heel, or what's uh, called insertional Achilles tendonitis, uh, that one you usually can uh, work through with a heel lift, um, utilizing a night splint and taking anti-inflammatories. So again, uh, if you've had the Achilles issue for a long time, that is one where I would seek medical attention uh, because you can have a small tear of your Achilles and a tear needs to be treated different than just tendonitis.